kind of way the alligator throws so mean. She leaves a girl, I swear to the world, she makes some alligators look tame. Salad Annie? Salad Annie? Here you got your granny. Here you got your granny. Because all the trees will even leaf out twice in a season, and they're one of the best fish baits. So traditionally, you'd catch the Catawba worms, you pop the head off. And totally safe to touch mushrooms that are toxic. Um, there's a few mushrooms that'll give rare people contact dermatitis, but just little little itchy spots, basically, not like it's a um, really big deal. Um, so how do we know that it's an amanita? The amanita is the, the big group of, they're really important ecologically. There's a few edible ones, and a few that'll kill you, and a few that, a few that we have nothing know nothing about. Kind of like the carrot family in the plant world. It's the big bulba. It's got a bulb at the bottom, called a bulba. Um, and then there's a veil underneath it. This mushroom and this one also, this is, this is called a russula. There's probably 40 to 50 species of red-capped russulas in the southeast. Um, so which one? I'm not going to even guess at which species. Um, if we were in Eastern Europe or Asia, a lot of these red ones are eaten widely. Um, but in the Southeast, because we don't really have that cultural knowledge left um, for many of our edible mushrooms, it's a, we sort of have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of that. Because unfortunately, through lots of other things, we're lost as well. But mushroom <coughs> things are one of the first things to go. Because the, anywhere the British got a hold of, they destroyed traditional mushroom knowledge. But the first and best thing is to encourage the, the, the uh, plants in category three. I see if I got my category straight. First category, those are the ones the plants you want to eradicate. Second category is the plants that are just basically neutral, like grass. They're not hurting anything. The bees are not getting anything out of the grass. And the third category, those are the ones you want. So you identify those plants in the third category and you encourage them. And there's a mason bee over there, a blue orchard bee. Uh, that's another kind of mason bee. And then, of course, you all know what a boar bee is. Uh, they're, they're big pollinators. And then the, the, the bumblebee. Now, these bees all feed their young pollen. They don't store nectar. Read that. Our most non-native pollinator. The bees are not native in North America. They came to Virginia, the first reported hives arrived in 1638 in Jamestown. Uh, here, you see the three casts of the honeybee, queen, drone, and worker. So, you know, mite counts, uh, mite thresholds are, are an arbitrary number that same, somebody came up with. One hive of bees can stand a lot, another one can't. Are they bad for bees? Yeah. Uh, but, I, I, I just couldn't see putting chemicals on a bug to kill bugs. That just made no sense right from the get-go. So do you spray them with any kind of, you don't use anything? Now I have screen bottoms on all my hives. That, that helps because my bees are hygienic. They groom each other, the mites fall off, they fall through to the ground. If you have solid bottom hives, they just crawl right down. things to break down and it can last for incredibly long periods in the forest. There's been some from the Pacific Northwest that's been carbon dated to be 250 years old. This wood is going to sit here for probably hundreds of years if there's not a fire or not another kind of disturbance. And so it works like a sponge because if you put brown cubicle rot under the microscope it has very similar cell structure to anybody want to, does that pattern remind you of something else you've probably seen? 
Ice cubes, crystal, chlorophyll, yeah, yeah, but there's something in particular I'm shooting for. It happens to wood sometimes. Often when there's human intervention. Sometimes lightning is another hint. Mm. Fossilization. Fire. Fire. Have you seen a, um, a piece mm. of charcoal? But the cool thing, remember I said those brown cubicle rocks, they hold the nutrients. So if we tear into them, we can often find the mycorrhizal root tips. So these little roots that I'm going to pass around, they're swollen. And those are where the fungal net is going around the tips of the roots. So then those fungi spread out through the soil and they're pulling in nutrients. A single cubic inch could have several miles of these strands. That means under your footprint, you're walking on hundreds of miles of these little fungal filaments. They're spreading out, they're connecting trees, they're sh exchanging chemical signals. It's the whole wood wide web, you know, all sorts of communication is happening. <laughs> Who's ever heard of biochar in your gardens? <laughs> so for those of you that aren't familiar with biochar, basically what you do is you burn um, wood or any carbon in a, in a c controlled environment and right before it becomes ash, you basically seal off the air. So you can, you can stop it from burning. You can do it with a hose. If you have a fancy biochar kiln, you can do it in a kiln, cut off all the oxygen. Either way, you end up with basically pure charcoal. And that charcoal is also really hard to break down. And that's charcoal, but to turn it into biochar, what you do is you put that in a bucket of pea or a bucket of compost tea or something like that. And that basically works like a sponge. So if you were, for a simplified analogy, imagine taking a dry sponge and putting it in your garden bed. It's gonna suck in water, right? So it actually absorbs, in the case of the charcoal, it's absorbing the nutrients. So you have this golden opportunity to be able to put nutrients in there that won't leach. Now, the other type of decomposition is what's called a white rot. Can anybody guess why it might be called white rot? This is white. Because it's white, exactly. <laughs> and this is leaving behind almost pure cellulose. And this decomposes much quicker, quicker but the thing with, with white rots is they're sort of the chemical geniuses of the fungus world because they're actually breaking down the liquid. And so those are the ones that they're looking at potential for breaking down plastics, for doing all those other sorts of industrial applications. Ah, so good, so many, so many, so many, so many. <laughs> What's this? For the, uh, this is for the that? next uh, Christmas. Curly dot. We've got more clover and this is likely fescue. I don't know that species. Why aren't these plants right here? Owe it to the architecture of this building. Mm, okay. What is this reminiscent of? It clearly a design after. Oh. A Germanic lodge, right? A Germanic Swiss kind of Austrian lodge. These plants are here. It's because Europeans are here. All of these and all of these plants are important to European folk culture. So you have to have European honeybee plus the European clover plus the European architecture plus the people. What is this? <laughs> right? European. This is Europe Junior. There's a reason why this is so close to the human made structures. Because these are the kinds of plants that grow alongside humans. These are plants that have had a long and intimate relationship with humans. Okay? And somebody mentioned crabgrass, which is here. Just raise your hand if you love crabgrass. You should love crabgrass. Why? Because it holds the ground from erosion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to ask you another question before I get to the answer. What is the native grade of your scent? Like pass it without noticing. The only thing I think is this is your mother grain saying, don't you remember me? Mm -hmm. This is the grain of, of, of that part of the room. This grain, that's why it's here. Crabgrass is the same thing. It's a weed. This fungo is also a, a weed in there, hmm. right? The cultivation of food was not supposed to be hard. We're supposed to be eating weeds. That's how it is basically everywhere around the world. People are just eating weeds. It should not be difficult. Let me tell you this about invasive plants. 
They do not come unless they're invited. They're like vampires. Van invasive plants don't just show up. They're invited. And they have to have the right kind of conditions to grow. So this, these plants which we just overlook or try to pull up, all of these things have incredibly long histories. All of these things have had, not just long histories, because they've had long histories before their association with humans, but they have a long association with humans as well. Oh, gee. Botany is not a political. So if you're, if, if you got into this to do some stuff, like, hey, I don't want to do that stuff. You're in it. <laughs> Botany, both historically and currently, is not an apolitical thing, right? Um, so the Chelsea Physic Garden. So the question is, why, why this and not this? Mm -hmm. How is there any money to be made? You know what I call Queen Anne's lace? Nope. Looks like lace, but what? Lots of queens had lace. Why Queen Anne? I don't know. She was beheaded. She was beheaded. Nope. You, can't, you can't see it now because it's not in here. But sometimes there'll be this little peak in here, and basically people will say that that's what Queen Anne had her neck chopped off, and this was the rough. Ah, oh, the lace oh, around. Oh. Got it. Cool not story. One here now.